Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Dane Zorko here from the Brisbane Lions. Jason Johannesson from the Western Bulldogs. Luke Parker here from the Sydney Swans. It's Roy Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows, and you're listening to the Coaches Panel. Max Wall and Melbourne Football Club. This is Matt Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club, and you're listening to the Coaches Panel. Number 42 in the 50 most relevant. Maybe it's a surprise for you. Maybe it's a bit of a shocker. Dane Zorko, the Brisbane Lions captain. Yep, you heard him just in the intro before. He's in the 50 most relevant. And uh, I haven't. I promise I haven't had him on hold for 24 hours. But uh, look, Tim is on the podcast chatting uh, about him. Hello, mate. How are you? I'm good. Good to be back again. It's good to have you back. Let, let's talk about this 30-year-old, Dane Zorko. Midfielder only yet again this year. It's been a couple of years now. He hasn't had that forward eligibility. But gosh, this guy... Um, when he gets going, he can absolutely pump out the big fantasy scores. Uh, his best scores last year uh, were against Melbourne in AFL Fantasy. It was 143, while in Super Coaches was a 155. After a slow start, he ended the year averaging 104.1 in Fantasy and Dream Team and 106.6 in Super Coach. Uh, in that format, he is going to set you back just under $580,000. A little bit pricier, though, for you in Anfield Dream Team at seven fifty three at time of recording. Uh, the uh, amount he will set you back in AFL Fantasy has yet to be revealed. But Dane Zorko is a real interesting one for us, um, isn't he, Tim? Because he started incredibly slow when it came to output. And if you started him last year, gosh, you got a little bit burnt in those first six or seven weeks. Oh, did you ever? I imagine um, a few people would have rage traded him out in the first seven weeks as uh, people like to do when they've got a, a lot of trades up their sleeve still. So anyone who did that um, probably regretted it over the course of the season, but uh, he's very much that kind of player, isn't he? He's, he's sort of relatively consistent across his career, but um from week to week or even from like month to month, he can be very up and down. Yeah, the variable or, or you know, the deviation or whatever kind of terminology you want to use um, it is quite significant with him. There is a genuinely a, a normal key reason, and that is more a tag that comes to him more than anybody else. He's one of the premiums that we have that is of most impact, um, that when a tag comes his way, his scoring significantly falls away. But yeah, you're right. If you started him last year, he would have been unique, and you would have thought, oh, well, he's a little bit undervalued, priced around 95 96 across the formats. But when the opening six games of the year, he just gives you one AFL Fantasy and Dream Team ton and two in Supercoach, you're starting to hurt a little bit. In fact, up to the multi-buy round, um, he was only averaging 97 in Dream Team and 98 in Supercoach. Again, it's pretty much what you were paying for. But if you would have jumped off him before the buy, it would have been over those first six weeks where he was really struggling to score. However, it was after the multi-buy round that he really got cracking in Supercoach over the final 10 games. He averaged 116.8. He had eight tons from those 10 games. Five of those hundreds were over 120. And crazily enough, three were over 140. In Dream Team and Fantasy over those 10 games, he averaged 111, eight tons, and five over 120. What I love about Zorko is not just the, his low ownership numbers, but he's got the ability to go on these big scoring runs and get big, big hundreds as well. He certainly can, and he's had many a game over the years where he's just pumped out a big 140, and anyone who has him, as you say, would be relatively unique and would just be sitting there watching because once he starts off a game like that, and as you say, if he doesn't get a tag, he tends to just keep going on in that game. So if he hits 40 at quarter time, he, he quite often just keeps on going for the whole game. So um, he's nice to watch in those games, but uh, obviously the reverse can also be true. Um, one interesting thing on all these big scoring last year, it's interesting you said it was all back half of the season because um, I mean, knowing Supercoach in particular, I think he had about a third of his games were over 120. Yeah, and yeah. With, with the exception of Richmond in the last round, the rest of them were all against teams outside the eight. Yeah. So I'm not sure if it's just that he's picking the easier opponents or it just happened to be that way um, or he's just kicked on in the second half of the year. But it's um, it's an interesting way to sort of look at him, like which way do you split up his numbers and which ones can you rely on? 
Yeah, look, you know, there were still good scores against quality opponents. You're right, there's Richmond. Uh, he managed to get a 121 in Dream Team and Fantasy against GWS, the eventual runner-up for us um, during the year. But that back half of the year, um, it was very, very heavy to the uh, Geelong, you know, 104 in Supercoach. Uh, the reason for a quieter score um, in round 20, he's just had a little bit of hamstring tightness. Um, the, the club were a little bit concerned, but he came out, you know, the very next week and went bang against Gold Coast with that 130 and 142 in Supercoach. 130 was the dream team and fantasy score. Look, earlier in the year, he did have a couple of okay scores. He went 136, 134, 118 in dream team and fantasy against the Swans, the Bulldogs and the Crows at that time. None of them were really flying. And 128, 1. 14 and 121 in Supercoach. So look, there is, that's probably a slight flag, isn't it, for us to go, look, with the exception of Richmond in the final round, he didn't have any monster scores, but then his AFL finals, when Brisbane were relatively poor as a side, he got 101 and 108 in Dream Team and Fantasy and 109 and 119 in Supercoach. So it's probably not a huge thing, but it's definitely something to take note of, isn't it? Uh, it is, yeah, it is. Because um, I guess someone like him, you'd... Um if you're also looking at, you know, do you start with him? Do you leave him as an upgrade target? Um, and if you're leaving him as an upgrade target, particularly given how his scores can go, you'd really be looking at a particular time in the fixture and like, when is the time that I want this guy in? Yeah. Um, because you know that he is, look, history would suggest he's going to have big games at some point this year. And um, if you're going to have him in your team at all, you want to make sure he's in your team when he has those scores. Absolutely. And the other thing that he does have outside of, you know, being able to go on a hot run pretty early um, and, and having great ceiling is his durability for uh, over across his career has been absolutely sensational. He's missed um, just the four games of football, I think it is, over the past seven years. Like, he just doesn't miss games of football. You've got to go back to, um, you know, his debut year, and that's just because it took him time to crack into the side back in 2012. But pretty much since then, he's been incredibly durable, and he does have a history of being a, a really strong scoring option. Back in 2017, um, in Dream Team and Fantasy, he averaged 114. Um, and in 2016, he averaged 106, um, you know, and averaged uh, pretty similar in Supercoach as well, a 110 and a, a 108. So we know we've got this guy that's got the ability to score really, really well. He has a really strong ceiling about him, and he's incredibly durable, and he will be unique. It does tick a lot of those boxes that we're looking for, but then there is that kind of thing you mentioned there, and it's it's two-pronged, is... His deviation of scoring is his highs and lows. There's almost a hundred points between them. There is, so it, it almost suggests like this year, like if you start with him and he has a slow start, then um, you know, is it a mistake to jump off him? Does history suggest he will definitely come back, and other people will be getting on him at his lower price? Yeah. Um, and just on one of those other old averages you mentioned, I remember there was a few years ago he even played one game with Gastro. Do you remember the yeah. infamous Gastro game yeah. against North? And I think he had about 15 or 20 points and uh, Rocky or Hanley or a couple of others had the same thing and everyone was losing their minds like, what's going on? But uh, still played the game, so... Yeah, he was running out the game, but other things were running out too. So um, he was struggling through there. Well, let's talk about it, you know, because... Lockie Neal entered into the side last year and there was a lot of talk around in early in the year that if you shut down Dane Zorko, you shut down not only him and his output in a game, but you also shut down the Brisbane midfield. However, it started to kind of twist a little bit towards the middle and latter half of the year where people started, you know, Lockie Neal's numbers were huge. He was getting 40 plus possessions every week. He was leading the brown low in many people's minds up until, you know, sort of the halfway marker. Does the move of Lockie Neal into that side now kind of give you more confidence to start and or trade in a Dane Zorko? Uh, that's really interesting because before Neal, he obviously had Beams. Yeah. And uh, obviously Beams wasn't quite so good in 2019 at the Pies. But at Brisbane, he was a bit of a dominant midfielder when he was fit. Mm. And um, and Beams, I guess Beams like Zorko also kicked goals. Um, Whereas if teams look to shut down Zorka nowadays, he's a bit more dangerous forward to centre off the two, whereas Neil is sort of everywhere dangerous. Um, so, yeah, look, that's a hard one to say. I think teams have looked at both of them, haven't they? It's um, not necessarily that easy to pick which one they'd prefer to go to over the course of a season. 
Yeah, look, and the other factor for people could be that there's there's a few is they've got such a strong young group of kids coming through. Hugh McCluggage, Jared Berry, um, you know, Lyons is complementing that midfield nicely, certainly not on the younger side. They'll want to keep getting midfield minutes into guys like a Cam Rayner. Can you see a world where this year that he loses some of that midfield time and has such that scoring potential? Or is it, no, 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 he's still at 30, got plenty of time, and he's going to get plenty of opportunity? Yeah, well, I think he's about to turn 31 too in Feb. Um, But durable, as you say. Look, I wouldn't think so, because I think Mitch Robinson sort of got a bit more in there Mm. last year, and you'd imagine he'd be... First a bit more forward as he used to be rather than Zorko. Um, Zorko may be more forward when he's being tagged, I suppose. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't think that they'd knock Zorko out, especially given how well they played last season. And they might be thinking, look, this is this is our chance. I know we've, they've got a lot of young kids, but they might be thinking we're good enough to win now. So let's try and win now. Yeah, no, I, look, I can't see that happening. I think in time, you know, you'll certainly lose some of that midfield um, moments and midfield rotations, but I do think for the 2020 season he's going to retain that role that we've seen over the past few years. We do talk about um, is he a better upgrade or is he a better you know starting squad option for the first six weeks of the year? Just from a reference point, uh, the Hawks at the G, the Kangaroos at the Gabba, the Crows at Adelaide Oval, the Magpies at the Gabba, uh, the Bulldogs at Marvel Stadium, the Swans at the Gabba, and then GMHBA Stadium against the Cats. Then round eight, they come up against the Tigers at the Gabba. It's certainly not the easiest stretch of games for, for Brisbane to start off the season. No, well, I think the first three are all against non-finalists from last year, but the, um, after that, I think just almost all of them were uh, well, it's from the top eight. But, um, you know, how much does that mean? Who's going to finish in the top eight in this 2020? Year. Yeah. You know, uh, the way it's been the last three or four years, it's been very hard to pick. So. And it's very similar um, coming off the bye too. Look, it's uh, they come off the bye against North Melbourne, Melbourne, Hawthorne, Collingwood, Geelong, Carlton and St Kilda. It's very, very similar. Yeah, well, there you go. Well, I guess they finished in the top four or top six, so the um, the fixture is meant to be slightly harder. But uh, yeah, look, I'm not sure. You'd have to look at his fixture in depth and see if you can pick a time. Um, it might also depend on who else you've got from his his buy round, whether it suits you to have him in before or after the buy round. Yeah, and that's it. You know, some people could. Yeah, you know, there's popular premiums such as his teammate Lockie Neal, Patrick Dangerfield, Mitch Duncan, Elliot Yo, Luke Shuey, Zach Merritt. Um, you might be tempted to uh, pick one of the Saints or the power midfielders that roll through there. Um, so there are options uh, galore. Right now for me, I'm not looking to start him, although I love the fact that he will be a unique option. But gosh, I. I think there's a potential that he could be a nice little pickup, you know, even before buys, but definitely on that back half of the year. I'd love what he can do because his consistency in terms of durability and not missing games and all the potential he has for big ceiling is certainly something I like. Yeah, well, he's he's definitely a difference maker if you can get him in the mm. run of form. Like if, you've, if you're at the top of your league or doing well in the rankings, he's one of those players that you don't like everyone else to have because you think, look, if, if he clicks here, then they're going to claw back points on me or wins on me. So it's, um, yeah, he's definitely a risk reward kind of guy at different times of the year. Yeah. And if you can get on the right side of that reward, then happy days. Let's talk about drafts right now in terms of his average, he's ranked inside the top 15 midfielders across all the formats. And I certainly forecast um, in my ranks at the moment that he's going to be around that across the formats as well but he's probably not um, an M1 for anyone. You're probably running a little too thin if he's your M1, unless you've landed yourself a Lockie Whitfield or a, or a Jake Lloyd or a Brody Grundy or a Max Gorn in the first round. Then I, you know, I'm maybe not so opposed to that. But would you ideally want him as an M1 or an M2? Look, ideally M2, but I think you just hit on the head. He's, um, he's someone you, you could live with as an M1, but you'd want your M2 to be you know, a fairly similar kind of player. Like you might get him if you had pick one, you might hope for someone like him at your uh, second or third pick sort of thing. Um, depending, you know, if he's not your M1, you'd want a star and another line somewhere. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like just for that sort of trade off, he's just because his durability, even, uh, you know, as we said, he's pretty much guaranteed touch wood to, yeah. to play 20 plus games a season. So you'd pretty much take that. I mean, 
every year in the first round, there's always like a consensus sort of top 10 or 15 that tend to go in most drafts. And some of them, like Angus Brayshaw, for example, or whoever, just mm. aren't a patch on it. But he's at least, you know, never been a terrible pick in a draft. Yeah, look, for me, it's kind of one of those things that if he's your M1, it's because you want to have locked in one of the big boys of the other lines. And then you're probably looking with your third selection to go and pick someone like a, I don't know, like a Matt and Brad Crouch or a, um, you know, a Pendlebury or a something like that, like something really strong and dependable that it means your M1 and M2, um, you know, really don't have much gap between them. It is certainly a, a thing that I wouldn't be opposed to if for whatever reason he ends up as your M1 and um, that's because you've got a, a very late second round pick. Yeah, I think that's probably the way to go, yeah. And as you said, if you can get him as your M2, then... Happy days. Yep, exactly. And, uh, right. I just going to mention very quickly for anyone who does category leagues, he's um, long been a good good premium mid in that as well. He's generally uh, with his goal kicking, his kicks and his tackles, he's pretty elite for a midfielder. But mm. um, he's not so much of a handballer. No, he, he's a Kevin Bartlett fan, isn't he? He's. I think they get along all right. Yeah, I think they do too. <laughs> hey man, appreciate your thoughts today as we talked about Dane Zorko. Yep, no worries. If you want to go and check out the article, that is online for you now at coachespanel.tv. The links for all the other players you can check out there. And to join our Patreon army, support the Coaches Panel. You'll get early access to these podcast episodes and additional extra resource that is exclusive to the Patreon army. If you're loving these podcasts, do make sure you give a five-star rating and review. You let your friends, families, and even your enemies know about the coaches panel. And we're getting real close to entering out of the 40s. And there's an absolute cracker that we've got lined up for you tomorrow. And maybe it's another surprising name, just like Dane Zorko is. 